did you grow up here? Or did you grow up in? No, I was born in San Francisco and grew up uh, in the suburbs of San Francisco and uh, didn't move to Ohio until a few years ago, actually. My okay. wife's from Ohio and I uh, took advantage of an early, I'd been a television writer for years and the Writers Guild offered this like early pension and we're like, hey, let's take it and go to Ohio where we can live for a dollar. Oh shit. <laughs> so okay. that's really why I mean that I mean I I like Ohio my wife's family's here and I actually lo really like my wife's family they're very cool. Um and so it was all, you know, good. And it's not like when you retire as a writer you have to not touch pens anymore. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's kind of a silly thing that you're like not really retired. <laughs> you still just work, you not. still write, you still get paid to write. So it's like, what's the downside? <laughs> I don't understand this. So yeah, so it worked out for us and we That's were able crazy. to get out of uh uh you know, our place in LA, which was just I love LA. It was just very, very expensive. Of course. Yeah. Guys, we have a uh, Mike Larson here, f fucking T V writer, comedian uh, I don't know yeah. other credits. Uh, what other credits yeah. you got? Well, I mean that's actor. For most part, I've done a little bit of acting. Okay, but I've also done a lot of uh, writing outside of comedy, like speech writing, and I work, okay. worked for a congresswoman for a while and different oh, things. Oh, you know. okay. I've pretty much I've squeezed everything I can out of my ability <laughs> to write stories. I mean, seriously, I got one talent. I'm a good storyteller, and okay. figured out a way to make a little bit of money doing it so, so when when did you know that you wanted to tell stories oh i don't know i mean i tell this you know it's it's my grandmother my dad's mom was this wonderful crazy alcoholic woman who lived uh in the haight ashbury in the 60s okay. right and it was just this and she told these crazy, complete bullshit stories whenever she came over. And she was usually drunk. And it really used to piss my dad off that she just, you know, none of that's true. And I remember her saying one day, I'm a storyteller. I don't have to tell the truth. And I remember at like eight years old going, oh, oh that's awesome. <laughs> but I don't, you know, not like that. That's then I, I plotted my life. But it's always kind of stuck with me that, uh, and it's true, as long as you're entertaining. If you're not entertaining, then you're a liar. But, you know, if you're entertaining, you're a storyteller. Ah, uh, okay. That's right? A, I mean, oh, yeah. even when someone tells us some crazy tale, I mean, as long as it's not malicious in some way, even you find out later they made it up, if they entertained you, you're like, ah, oh, cool. <laughs> that was a good story. Okay. Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, so if yeah. it's bad, you're a liar. If it's good. Yeah, oh, right. <laughs> like, of course we're liars. I mean, of course we're, yeah, your story, you make stuff up, yeah, right? That's interesting. Okay. You know. So you started doing that. And then when did you start, like, actually, like, putting your energy towards it? Like, was it, like, pretty early? So uh, I went to college and studied political science. And I was, I had done theater in high school, you know, like, okay. and... I loved that. I loved being on stage. Um, but I found when I got into college and was doing other things, I just didn't have time. And I wasn't a theater major. So I wasn't going to, you know. So I kind of started doing stand or at least going to open mics in San Francisco. Okay. Uh, in co college. And, and this is going to sound like ancient history, but also like the, the local comics in San Francisco when I was first going to open mics were like, Robin Williams, Paula Poundstone, Dana Carvey, Dude, Bob Goldthwait. Shit. Those are the locals. <laughs> Those are the locals. My first Dude, open mic, shit. Dana Carvey was the host of the open mic. My very first time I went on stage. So it was so it's always scary to do your first open mic, right? Yeah. I mean of you course. show up at the at Saver Pint, it's yeah. still scary. It doesn't yeah. matter where You're standing or who on else the ground is there. in front of a bunch of wine bottles. But then know? on top of that, when you go and the others just comics hanging out are, you know, brilliant. Of course they weren't famous yet, but they were still, still brilliant. Hilarious. Yeah. You know, Paula Poundstone was I mean she would just go on and just do stream of consciousness for, you know, 20 minutes and you would, it would just, just crazy good. Dude. So then you're like, well, now I'm supposed to go up and 
Talk do something about yeah. masturbating or whatever you know you're doing is your first open mic you know so. uh was it just five minutes then too or how much time were you guys doing back then probably i don't i mean i was really so because i was in living in the suburbs so there was the san francisco comics that were either from the city but more likely came there as a professional choice people like bob goldthwaite who came from boston and uh, Paula came from Boston. A lot of you know people came, so they were, they were a whole different. So I was the kid from the suburbs who was like wanted to do open mic, and so it was really you know the okay. lowest of the low on the list. Um, and uh, my so the very first open mic story. Not only did was Dana Carvey the MC, but right before I was, I was going on last. Um, and right before I went on stage, Robin Williams dropped in, and they, and he had he, Mark and Mindy was on the air at the time, so he was just like the, the uh, you know the okay. And so I was gonna leave, and Dana Car Dana said, "No, you're not gonna. You're still gonna do your five minutes." And I was like, "No." And he said, "He said if you leave now, you'll never do this again. You have to do it, and it will never be this bad again. It will never be your first time following Robin Williams." <laughs> 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 And God, you know, I mean, I mean that that's more than anything has stuck with me. That just and look, say he wasn't famous Dana Carvey then. He was yeah. just, just local guy. But it was like he didn't have to do that. But he was also a kid from the Burbs. He grew up a couple okay. miles from Dude, me. Fuck. You know, so it was I can't just even awesome. imagine like now, like fucking. Yeah. But you also don't know. I mean, exactly. right? yeah, yeah, right. I mean, twenty years from now, you're gonna be. Xavier Dunson, he hosted the open mic, whatever. You don't know who Did, uh, who among your group is going to, you know. Yeah, I, you see, never know. I see a lot of people that I'm like, uh, there's a lot of people that I see that I'm like, I I think that you're funny enough that like as long as you keep it going, you know what I mean? So, okay, so you start doing open mics. You are studying political science. Yeah, so you poli sci. Uh, but that all made sense to me because it all it all came from writing. P politics is all storytelling, you know. It's it's uh, so, uh, so so that all made sense to me the same way. And in fact, one of the some of the first writing I did was writing for politicians when I was still in college. Okay. I got a reputation. You know, I was on campaigns. I got a reputation as a funny kid. And so, hey, you know, they can't say, hey, I'm going to the Teamsters. You got something for me? And I'd write them a little joke. And so that's really was kind of my first thing where I kind of, uh, and I remember, I don't know how, if I had ever, maybe I had done stand up at a high school talent show or something. But okay. that didn't, that kind of didn't count for me. Um, uh, but I remember seeing people do my jokes before I ever really did stand up. And I think that was part of it going, nah, I, I could have done it better than that. You know, oh, you really? know kind of mess, you know, you write and give a joke to like, especially like someone like a politician. Some are very gifted and others just are not, you know? Yeah. Uh, um, so, so you're right. So you're like, you're ghostwriting for these politicians and I they're going a lot they, of politics. They go up, they do your joke or whatever. And it kills. And then you're like, Oh man! Right. Well, if oh, it kills, man. it's awesome. No, no, no. If it kills, it's it's more. It's yeah. We're right. The hard part is when people, when because you, you want to, and I've, I'm, I've ghostwritten for a lot of people. And the hard, the, the the at first, the hardest thing is that you don't you can't claim credit for it. Okay. You know, um, certainly not for a specific line. I mean, you, and especially <laughs> if they bought it. You know, they bought it. That's their car now. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> you know, not yours. Um, but. Uh, but what was more frustrating as a kid doing it was when someone would just completely mess it up or they would mess it up and then someone would get mad at me for giving them a crappy joke. And I'd be like, no, man, he fucked it up. He didn't do it right. You know, I even underlined the word he was supposed to hit, you know, whatever, you know. But that's really what got me. Sometimes it excited. is just a word, too, man. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. dude, I mean, we uh, attitude pacing. All of that. Yeah, man, because I know that we, we've been doing writing sessions together, Ridge and I, and okay. like it, I was helping him out with a joke, and I was like, dude, you have to say this word and not this other word that you have been saying, like because if you don't, it's not going to... Well, like and knowing, for instance, when, you know, our mind, I don't know if you want to get into oh. jo joke theory, but that's... Ooh, um, okay. Our mind 
um, recognizes patterns, right? That's yep. that's how we how animals stay alive. Yep. They know that there's always food here and there's a bear there. Go there, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Whatever. Uh-huh. So jokes are, are just you know what what uh, short stories of the surprise ending, right? And, um, but we play on patterns. That's why the rule of three. Why the you know. You know, the first one, you, know, you have a premise, you, ha- you set a pattern with the second part of the three, right? And then the third one is the joke. But you have to set a pattern for, the, for people in order for the joke to work. Now, on the other side, if someone uses the same word um, haphazardly, like in a set, it drives me crazy. Because it's like, you have a joke later that has the word beast in it. You can't use beast just oh, for any other thing. Yeah. That has an important word later, you, you know. Interesting. Um, and it's, it re- especially like in a joke, but even like in a set, I'll think, especially if it's a word, you know, you know, I, I try not to use a word unless I mean it, unless anything that's like, you know. Uh, even mentioning, you know, if I, I don't do wife jokes and if I had a bunch of jokes about my <laughs> wife, I wouldn't just casually mention my wife early on unless there was a, re- unless I, it was a reason. Like a callback or something. Right. Yeah. But I always tell people we re- that, that j- comedy is, is so similar to music. I mean, it absolutely, uh, I mean, the, the lyrics are important, but, but the timing is even more important and the tone um, and I mean, all those different things, when you just think the difference of, you know, uh, you know, if Bill Maher did Mitch Hedberg, it would suck, you yeah. know, and vice versa. Well, Mitch Hedberg would make anything funny, but, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's so much, it's not. I'm surprised Bill Maher can do anything funny. <laughs> just, uh, just, Bill, yeah. Just kidding. He's like, yeah. he used to pay me. <laughs> oh, no, I will, I will gladly tie. I tell, people ask me if what. If people often ask me, is Bill Maher an asshole? And I would say yes, and Bill would say the same thing. Yeah. But I will also say that as a boss, I could not ask for an easier boss to work for because he's predictable. And in comedy writing, any kind of writing for, and you're always writing for egomaniacs, usually, at least okay, what I'm yeah. writing for. Um, and so you get one that you can predict their reaction to things that uh, that makes your life so much easier. Okay. You know, so Bill was very, I, I only, I wrote for him for about a year, season and a half, I think. How does that happen? Um, so how do you, how do you audition for these little bits? How do you like get into these like little jobs and niches? So you're in college, you writing for politicians. Yeah, well, Bill Maher was well after college. So yeah, so college, right. So after college, I... Uh, went to Washington D.C. to do more to politicians? use my degree. Right, I got a degree in political science. I wanted to get a job on Capitol Hill or um, something like that, you know. And I went to D.C. and I did not get a job. <laughs> um, and it was, that was the first time I wrapped my head around the difference between Harvard and San Francisco State. You know, in high school. I had the attitude of college is college, man. I'm just going to get the paper, you know? Yeah. And I don't believe all that crap that I got to go to. But then you go up for a job and you like see that everyone there either went to Ivy League or Georgetown (laughs) or one of those. And people through San Francisco State. And I I would get like (laughs) things like people are like, really? You went to state? You don't seem like it. Which they meant as a compliment. I was like. (laughs) Thank you and fuck you, right? Dude, that's, you know? that's so funny. I was talking to a wealthy per- like like uh-huh. or like you know upper middle class right. person recently, and they were ta- talking about someone's house that they went to, and they were like, "I went to their house and everything just looked donated," and I'm just <laughs> like, you know, someone who's like working with uh-huh. mostly donated right, items, and right. I'm like, ah, I know what you mean, but that like, so fuck. Funny. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, so it was in the real world. Yeah. I see. Oh, yeah. No. That's yeah. funny. Right. So uh, you tried to get a job. You didn't get a job. So I didn't get a job on the, uh, on the hill. And, and then you went back a, home. Uh, there was a, no, so I was in D.C., um, and uh, I didn't come from a family that could afford a round-trip ticket to D.C. My, my parents got me to D.C., but that's as far as they could. I mean, we oh, just didn't shit. have money to spend. We had a lot of kids and no money. So, so once I got to D.C., I was there. 
you know, had to you, figure it out. You don't get your dream job. So I got a, I actually got a, 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 a fun little job teaching high school kids who came, came to DC, like on their, their, you know, their senior trip to DC or whatever. Okay, and okay. you, I, you would like teach them stuff and take them on tours. That was a cool job. But while I was doing that, there was a comedy club uh, in Arlington, Virginia, that uh, if you did, they, were, they needed open micers. And so they had a thing up that if you did five minutes and got a laugh, you got a beer and like a bowl of chili. And I was like, <laughs> I was, you know, 22, I broke. And I, like, I was like, yeah, I'll do that. But had this thought in my head of San Francisco, what an open mic was, you know, and I was like scared to death, you know, that, yeah. and then I got there and it wasn't, it was the, it was the, the real world where it was, um, just you normal know, local guys and okay. a couple were funny and a couple were kind of professional, but you know, and I did pretty well, well, but, but also they in their head i was from san francisco i wasn't just some schmo from oh, college oh you're the new kid i'm like oh one of those san francisco comics you know so i got a little bit of cachet that i totally didn't deserve but i went okay with it. started wearing my giants cap on stage <laughs> <laughs> you know you i mean that's I, probably the best advice i give to anyone in show business and anything is just be aware of your opportunities and take advantage you don't know where they're coming from yeah you, know, you work your ass off and you be really good at what you do so when you have an opportunity you can do it but you know some weird thing like they think i'm a san Fr all right okay. i'll lean into that I, you know whatever you know and so that ended up leading into opportunities then later so on that, well yes it also by the trick of fate that that also happened to be at a time when comedy was booming right when okay. cable television was yeah there i was, forgot this is also like four yes, years ago yes there was more <laughs> like there was more Shit, air dude. time than there was stuff to put on it and so suddenly wow. there was like comedy because there was all these really horrible comedy cable shows like every local market had a comedy show yeah usually hosted by like the weatherman or something uh, my first show was like arch campbell tonight or something like that it was called um but anyway comedy clubs were were opening okay and they needed um funny people they needed uh, funny people they needed um opening acts um and i um i'm an easy person to work with I mean, I've, I've, I got a reputation from among comics that I was a fun person to work with. We wrote jokes during the day and we, whatever, whatever we were going to do, I was always up for it, whether we we're going, you know, yeah. and those things. So comics started just requesting me and I got to work with, I mean, I, I came along, I mean, I, friends who were 10 years older than me came along at the time where they could make money in that, you know, they were headliners when it, oh yeah, and where I was an opener, but who, who was the. Like so, you've opened for a bunch I've of people. I've opened for major who's, acts. Yeah. Who's your favorite act that you've opened for? No disrespect to anybody else. That oh you've done no, it. no, 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 no! It's, it's who's different. Your favorite? I mean, well, yeah. there's favorite act. Like as soon as you get off stage, you run out so you can watch their whole show. Okay. And there's a few people like that: Jake Johansson, Brian Regan, Paula Poundstone. Okay. Um, and then there's like favorite because it's just crazy. And so, you know, I opened for Bill Hicks a lot. And oh, if you know shit. who Hicks was. He does n his act did not age well. You watch it now. He was on he, net he, they were showing him on Netflix and I was like, "All right, I'm going back." And I was like, <laughs> "It's cuz he was hyper topical." Yeah. He'd be talking about what was in the paper today and it might not even be you know, if, Local if, to you. if we were in Roanoke, Virginia, he was talking about what the Roanoke City Council did today. Oh, why, okay. I mean, he would do that. And he was awesome. I'm just as a, you know, young comic. Interesting. Um, but he was also hick. So he yeah. was, he was, you know, getting arrested and getting bailed out in time for shows. And, you know, dang, you opened it for him a lot. Nice. Yeah, because I started working in Texas through a like a, a fluke. Like a friend of mine went to school with a guy who 
managed a club and they needed an MC, whatever. You know, again, you, know, again, you get an opportunity and you make the most of it, you know. Um, and uh, while I was there, Houston at the time was a major comedy town as well, right? And yeah. it was the Houston comics were Hicks, Kinnison, um, two of the best comics you've maybe never heard of, Jack Mayberry and Fred Ooh. Greenlee. Uh, I've never heard of both them, yeah. brilliant. Um, uh, Fred Greenlee famously was on The Tonight Show. He's a great comic, and he had a very famous bit about suicide, and I guess Johnny Carson's son had committed suicide, and so the producer said, do not do a suicide joke. Do not do suicide. And he said, okay. So Fred is on the set, and he's killing, and we're all watching at the improv. He's killing on The Tonight Show for Johnny, right? And he gets to the last minute, and he decides to do his suicide joke. Nice. <laughs> and so the, the joke was, he talks about, he does the thing about it. He said, hey, have you ever, uh, ever, gone to kill you, ever gone to kill yourself, and you put your gun in your mouth, and it hits a filling? <laughs> oh, oh, I hate that. And then he did the joke about, if you're going to, I think I'd be a jumper if I kill myself. But if you're going to jump, pick the right building, man. No, don't pick a building too big for you. You know, and then he does the thing. He goes, "Whoa, <gasps> whoa!" <Whoa-ah! laughs> <laughs> 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 he checks his watch. Anyway, absolutely destroyed. One of the best tonight sets. Oh my ever. god! After his set, I remember the way it used to be with Johnny Carson is he would watch your show and as your set. If you did great, he'd call you over. Right, and that was the big thing with Johnny Carson. Oh, no. <laughs> and so Fred finishes his set. He turns around, and Johnny Carson has turned his back on him. <laughs> and he walks off. Best night of his life, right? The producer says, get the fuck out of here. You're never to come back here again. Dang. Um, so, anyway. Greenlee, among comedians who knew who know who Fred Greenlee is, was this kind of wow legend who, like, Johnny Carson doesn't tell me what to do. (laughs) See, I mean, I always feel like I want to do shit like that. But then at the same time, it's like, that's the consequences. (laughs) It's like, now you don't get invited back to Johnny Carson. (laughs) Right. You know, Um, right. Well, that's the thing, right? I mean, you take a chance. My attitude is it has to be something that I can live with the defeat later if it doesn't work. Yeah. You know, if I Because, I mean, he's still killed on The Tonight Show. You and know he was going to kill... He was killing anyway. Though. Yeah. That's the thing. Because then I worked with him maybe two weeks later. And... Uh, was it, like, big news? Like, was it, like... Like a like was it the buzz or something like that? Um, yeah, in the comedy world, and I think it was on Entertainment Tonight too. But but you know, it wasn't like there was <laughs> the TMZ of the time, right? And dun, there was dun, no dun. Twitter or you know anything that makes things blow up. Yeah. So among comedy people, so immediately among comedy clubs, there were a few that said, "Oh, we don't want Fred Greenlee," but the good ones are like, "We got to get Greenlee in here." <laughs> so he was, you know, and he's. He is, Uh, I don't know if there's ever anyone, when you watch yourself on stage, you realize you're, you're channeling someone else. I, when I am in my stride, when I look at it, it's like, that's, I'm, I'm thinking Fred Green. Like, just, he was like, so confident. He just had a swagger. Yeah. And so he would finish a joke. And if it didn't get a laugh, you felt bad. You know, if you didn't laugh at his joke, you're like, clearly there's a problem with me. (laughs) Cause look at how confident that guy is. Wow. You know? So that yeah, that's like one. He's one of the, like uh, Ron White, another Houston guy. But he was another guy who has that swagger. He just tells yeah. his joke and dares you not to laugh, you know. So you, okay. So you you did a lot of stand up. You were doing lots of stand up. It seems like how long were you doing stand up before you start writing for like so I didn't sitcoms, get a television? Well, and and Bill Maher. Like how's this? Oh, Bill all? Maher came much later. That was, so how old were you? So how well, old I, were I didn't you? get my first writing job. Well, I didn't really start stand up. Well, I guess twenty five was when I was in DC. So that's when I started. And I felt it was very late at the time because I knew there were there were comedians. That we're um, doing it already. That's how I like feel Like Louis right now. C.K. and yeah. Bill Hicks, who both were famous as, you know, they were 
teenagers. Chappelle, who came years later, you know, started at 14. You know, there's these people you're like, exactly. God, I'm an old man. I'm already out of college. Dude, trust <laughs> me, I, I know the feeling, especially uh, like I started so late. And then you go and ask all these people when you go to the open mics, like, how long you been doing it? How long you been doing it? It's like 12, 15 years. And I'm just like, fuck. Like. And, and you want to say the thing in your head. Yeah. And you still suck. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> dude you're not a comedian. Right? <laughs> no, it, it, no, I I encourage everyone to try comedy. Absolutely. Cuz we don't know. But yeah, there's those people who like it's it's and I know part of it is it's their social thing. It's, yeah. and I get that and God bless them. But yeah, when someone is like or if they've been doing it 12 years have you always been doing the the monologue thing? Because I would. Oh, I mean, yeah. I started. I played guitar when I started. It was horrible. I was For not a even stand up. Yeah, I did like song parodies when I my maybe oh. not my first open mic, but for as an MC, I used to do song parodies. Interesting. And, and, and I realized that everybody that I respected did not respect song parodies, and dude, that was the, that's not the that's, reason not to do it. But dude, that's was, like literally. I, so I've been doing like some comedy uh -huh. music recently, right? And like that's like the, the issue is like nobody likes like no none of my comedy friends like it, but like people who I do it for they like it. But it's just like, I mean, do I really want to be the guy that's like, oh Eddie, you're gonna be pulling out the ukulele today? Like, oh here's my God, here's my Jesus. if if I were a better if I were a musician, I would have stuck with it. Okay. I, I was not, I mean, I, I pretty much, I learned guitar at folk mass, you know, I knew like three chords, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> and so I just wasn't, so I worked with other comedians who did music, who were musicians. Um, Haywood Banks, there's a guy named Tom Anzalone out of Pennsylvania, who I think is still doing it, who was amazing. Um, and so actually, I remember opening for, for Tom Anzalone, and he, I remember me telling him I didn't want to do my song parodies. And I said, they're just not any good. And he said, oh, they're pretty good, you know. And so he said, uh, sell them to me, and then you can't do them anymore. And so he gave me, I think, $10 and bought me lunch for my horror. They weren't even very good. He was basically just doing me a favor. Uh, but he's like, now you can't. They're my, you, which was like, I needed that. Interesting. Never tempted to so go you back. Just, you just been selling all your shit all your life, all your jokes, all your hey, music. Man, <laughs> if, you, if you write a joke, which is like it's hard to find something more worthless than just a joke in and of itself, right? And if someone, if there's like a way to attach a nickel to that, that's yeah. How do you? Uh, we shouldn't be doing this for ourselves. How do you? Uh, how do you piece out like prices and stuff like that? Like like now that you're a professional. So like, well, in the, I mean, for, for a real, I mean, in the real professional world, I have agents, you know, an agent and a manager for that. I mean, for as a television okay. writer, I mean, that's how you, uh, but, but every step of my career, my first television writing job, every one of them were, were a million coincidences and opportunities had to line up. And when I look at it now and think, God, all of those things that if I did that instead of that, if I, if I didn't go to that party or if I, whatever. Now, yeah, other opportunities maybe would have presented yeah. themselves. But still, um, it, it's, never, it's never good to look at, the, at like someone's career, you know, 30 years into it and say, they had a path. It's like, no, uh, they didn't. Yeah. No, they didn't. Unless you were like born a Rockefeller. You don't have a path. We just, exactly. Right? You, you, we, we. Suburbs of San Francisco. There, you know, what, <laughs> you what path did you have? Actually, you know where I knew I was, I mean, I knew, I have a funny family. My mom, hilarious. And if I could make my mom laugh, I knew I was funny. But at my first job was as a peanut vendor at the ballpark. At, okay. At Candlestick Park where the Giants and 49ers played. Um, and I was a tiny kid and really kind of a shy kid. And, and you have to yell, you know, you have to yell peanuts. And, and I learned pretty early on that if I made people laugh, they'd buy my peanuts. So I used to talk about like souvenir peanuts, souvenir, <laughs> every peanut, an original, you know, and people, they were a quarter a bag then. It was like, you know, it wasn't like the big bag you getting out of the ballpark, but, uh, but I, I, 
people would say, hey, peanut guy, I'll buy your peanuts. And so that was kind of like, I think, kind of my first thought of like, hey, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a speaker. Maybe there's something to this. Just being, making people laugh. Maybe there's. You know. So what, so what made you um, decide to like, did you like stop doing stand up when you were doing all the writing for like these TV shows? And yeah, I kind of. Re- First, it was kind of forced on me because because when I finally got a writing, you know, I was I got to L.A. in 88 and I had, I had become a you know, I was a regular uh, uh, MC at the improv, um, uh, which where I, you know, worked with a lot a ton of I mean, every every comic in that era pretty much came through the improv Um and so when I got my writing job, that was really an opportunity for me then to cash in and get the good spots at the improv because now I have a major credit. You know, my first job was a uh, a show called Grace Under Fire, but um, the uh, but the demands of a writing job, the hours are are Super <laughs> crazy, weird probably. and unpredictable, especially for that show because we had a just a drama going on in that show but um so it was you know i would book a spot i you call in and get a spot at the improv and if you think about you know how many comedian how many really good professional comedians are in los angeles and they're all calling in for spots at the improv right and so you get one that's a big fucking deal and then if you are you don't show up for it because you work late you know i just and that so I stopped calling in for spots because I was like, I don't know if you're gonna make it. I don't want to. I, I I don't want to show that disrespect for one thing, and yeah. and and I don't know. I you know. So I kept thinking, I'll it'll work. So so yeah. So for a while. So then I I just kind of started. I just did spots here and there. I wouldn't do the improv. I would occasionally do the improv. Occasionally do the comedy store, and the Ice House was like my home club out there in Pasadena but um, but but the big difference and I, was, I was talking about this with the comics last night at the show the um, when you're a comedian everything that happens to you all day long is filtered through how does this work on stage right everything yeah. we do from buying a smoothie to getting a flat tire if you're a comedian you're thinking oh, all right I'm gonna what's my take on whatever however you exactly do it, right when you write for a television show and get say i was i was a i grew up with no, we had no <laughs> growing up so suddenly getting the lowest scale television writer money which the other writers would not get out of bed for was to me like the lottery you, you know that i was making i don't even know what it was that first year but but it was huge for me and it was a lifesaver. I was 36 years old. I was getting to a point where it's like, I got to have a career. I can't just be an aspiring something, you know? Um, so, you know, damn. sorry, I hit too close to home. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not 36 <laughs> yet, but damn. But you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go through yeah. So, uh, but no, but the big difference in your head is that when something, when a, when you get a flat tire, you're not thinking, how does this work on stage? You're thinking, how does the star of my show, what's that flat tire episode I can write for the show? So Uh. they'll hire me next year too, (laughs) you know? So part of it for me was, I was just not mining stand up material anymore. Yeah. Because your energy is being taken away by the show. And I was happy to do it. And and in a good writer's room, when you're in a room with 10 other really funny people, I mean, that is a better high even than doing stand-up. When you were, because it's just riffing with, you know, great comedy writers, yeah. you know. Um, so, so I loved it. That I, back patio is like, you know, I, I definitely feel that. Especially when you're one of the people that like throws something in and people are still laughing. You're like, yes, uh-huh. like, oh, this is great. Like yeah. the hangs are just amazing. Comedian hangs, one of the best hangs. Yeah. Well, I have found in Columbus, there does not seem to be as strong a culture among the comics of writing together, which is weird <clears throat> to me. Because everywhere else I've been... Comics write together, and I got, I I've gotten I think some weird looks from comics who get off stage, and I give them a joke. Hey man, I, you know, 
Like, why are you giving me a joke? That's what comics do. Yeah, I. I and it shows in some of the mm-hmm. comics who've been doing it for twelve years and and still haven't quite understood what a joke is. That you know, there's a like it was, yeah. The just end missing. part needs to be funnier than the beginning part. Okay, I mean, <laughs> you know, whatever the basics of joke writing is, <laughs> you know. Um, Dang. And, and we don't get. I mean, I was. So much of my, especially when I was broke in L.A. or San Francisco or D.C., Just what else together. do you do other than hang out and exactly. work on each other's act? Dude, you know, that is something that, uh, you know, we actually t- talk about between ourselves because there's like, there's little groups, you know, here and there, you know, it yeah. happens. And I feel like uh, when I talk to other comedians from other cities like Cincinnati <clears throat> or whatnot, they say that like, Columbus is like one of the worst when it comes to that. So, I was surprised when I got here. Yeah. How little. Now, I did a little bit. I When I first got here, um, Kenny Mock and Bobby and sometimes Jay, we'd hang out a little bit and write jokes sometimes before yeah. they had their podcast. Um, but, you know, they, they got busy. Yeah. Um, which is good. It's what we want. Um, but, yeah, I was. Uh, I was surprised. But, yeah, uh, there's there's definitely gr- there's pockets of uh, comedians that uh, are down and like they, we always talk about it, but every time like something gets close, it like fizzles out and it like never happens. Well, and just watching <clears throat> now, you know, the Shrunken Head, which is an incredible room for a, for to do a comedy show. Yeah. Um, I don't know what they have against lights, but uh, why, why is there not a light for this? I mean, that place has been around since what, like eighteen twenty? They know how to. There's Dude. no light over the stage. I know. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> and they're really easy. You know, you can get them like like Just they sell one them like light. warm chicken coops. They're like yeah. they're really easy. You clip Dude. on something. Oh my god, that is so <laughs> fucking true. Because especially when you're trying to film yourself, it's, it's like uh, there's but, no light. The basic, I mean, just the idea of the entertainer should be the center of attention. That's not groundbreaking. We want in a room, a dark room. Yeah. <laughs> really, when you walk in that room, the only you know thing what? that gets I, your attention is the jukebox because it's lit up. You know what? Yeah. That's actually interesting because I never thought about that playing a role in like potentially like selling your jokes it's or not. It's amateur from the minute anyone walks in there because there's not... The room, and it's a great room. When I walked in there, I was like, oh, my God. Are you, this would be a good place to record an album in. You pack <laughs> this place. <laughs> Until there's it no light. <laughs> awesome. And so the first night I was there, there was some sort of like kind of reddish light. I'm sure they have bands probably, right? So bands yeah. don't always need – a lot of bands don't want a light. And that's fine. They're yeah. just playing dance music, uh-huh. whatever. That, that, that's probably what it was. Um, but then the last one <laughs> was in absolute darkness. Uh huh. Um, but, um, but, but no, I'm saying that open mics, you know, serve many purposes. And one of them is mental health for the people who that's their time to get up and talk. And that, and I don't. <laughs> I don't diminish that at all. That's an important. <laughs> that's probably the most important thing comedians do for the community. Really, is, is have a place for the people who you're like, oh, thank God he's here. You, you know, whatever, right? There's and there's that's all those. So fucking funny. And some of them turn into really great comedians, right? Yeah. Some of them are like, whoa, oh my God, that guy. You know, that guy learned to write jokes. Awesome. Yeah, dude. I there. Oh man, there's been a few people that have gone up. Uh, you know that. Are insane yeah and yeah like you, we've had like a, some homeless guys come up before like it's oh and especially especially the ones that do like the monologuing those are the ones that are fun to watch because yeah. like some of them like actually are like trying to maybe do something and it's like okay this is kind of kind of cool but the ones that are just like fucking just going and they're just like fucking whatever medicine they're on is just taking them on a ride a couple weeks ago there was a Oh, no. Trans woman, a oh, young no. trans person. I'm okay. saying, I think it was first time on stage and was very nervous, was talking about the whole trans experience and okay. wasn't sure what to do. And he was just kind of feeling it out. And that's, you know, and it was like, oh, this is interesting. And then, like, as an aside, 
Uh, they said, uh, I found out I had no gag reflex at Bible camp. I <laughs> fucking greatest joke ever, right? Everyone's and and they were shocked that people were laughing so hard, right? And then he talked about how at Bible camp, every you used to get popsicles, and yeah. and and people were like amazed that he could like, you know, do his entire popsicle. So he gets off stage, and I was and I was like, I hope you try this again. And I said, do me for next time you go on stage, do not even tell them your name. Do the gag reflex. First thing, after that, everything you say will be golden. Trust me. Because everything you say will go back to that. And we clearly, you're, you know, you're, you're trans, you're going through all this stuff. You, we all are like, whoa, what kind of childhood did this person have, you know? That's but, crazy, But it was yeah. this great thing where I think, you know, for whatever reason they meant to go and they did. <laughs> Somewhere deep down, they knew that was the joke. <laughs> you know, they had to know, or maybe they thought it was too vulgar, or too easy, or so. You know, how do you um, how do you gauge um, that? You know, you've been doing comedy for a really long time. You've been writing for TV. Uh -huh. You've been writing for you know Bill Maher. Bill Maher, I feel like at least now is a little bit more unfiltered. Now he's on HBO, but like, uh, uh, how would you say? How do you gauge? what the appropriateness level for a joke is well when i write for someone else i uh, that's, that's that's the great freedom of it right that's their job or or their producer's job i mean yes i i'm supposed to give them what they're what they are expecting for. from yeah. me uh but yeah i'll i'll certainly write things or like i sometimes will write things for people outside of comedy and i'll push the envelope and then i'll put a note and i'll say you know, and I'll try to explain. I think this would really, this could really work well if it works, but it could also not. And so we should discuss those things, you know. Um, but for a pro, like for in a comedy situation, you give them the joke and they do with, with it what they, what they want. Um, now, there have been situations because of my life also in the political world, I do... People in comedy know that I have a political sense to me, so they might say, "Hey, what do you think? Is this going too far?" You know, mm -hmm. um, and you That's know, my attitude is always in favor of comedy. If if it in any way you can save the comedy, save the comedy. You know, so you you know. But, you know, you weigh the consequence. You try to, but okay. but it's their choice, right? If you yeah. do the joke, that's, you know, when comics, like, do something, oh, oh, nothing pisses me off more when a comic does something, goes on a rant and whatever, and gets video, and then, he, oh, you know, tries to backpedal. It's like, own it, man. You're a comic. You knew yeah. what you were doing. I have never said a syllable on stage that I didn't mean to say. Now... I regretted it, and, and, and you know, <laughs> sure, but don't. It's not, no one makes me say anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so, especially comedians of all people, you know? It's, it's like, like I'm, I mean to say it, I just didn't mean the backlash that I'm getting. Are, <laughs> our entire career is based on, you never know what's going to come out of my mouth. Yeah. I'm a comedian, I'm crazy, right? So, yeah, then to say, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know. The, the best, actually, um, Rain Wilson recently had like a tweet that went viral because he, I don't even know what his original joke was. He made a joke, I guess it was a, a, about a, a trans woman or whatever, and it was harmless, but it was taken away. And he, he did like the best. He said, I, um, I apologize. It was a stupid joke. It was a funny joke. I did it. <laughs> I even knew it could be offensive and that's the part i apologize for it was my decision was wrong and i was like that's a great apology yeah and it's he, true it's absolutely true yeah it can be funny and offensive yeah exactly right that's exactly yeah. um what's what's your uh what's your take like uh which lines do you like to you know which line do you like to teeter do you like to teeter on that offensive side or are you more of like a as long as I feel like I'm punching up, I'll do anything. I don't, I don't, I, I've never had, I've never thought it was a lot of fun making fun of people that are easy to make fun of or that, that everyone else is making fun of. Yeah. So for instance, I will do, 
you know, people say, oh, you can't do a joke about whatever. <laughs> yeah. Whatever, trans or whatever. They say, whatever. and it's like, no, there is no subject that is off limits to any comedian. Yeah. But we we make our choices. So if you're offending people, don't be a pussy. You offended people. <laughs> Own it. Own it. God, it just try. But, but so, for instance, if I were to do a joke about th the subject matter, um, my joke wouldn't break on the victim. Yeah. My joke would break on the oppressor, right? I yeah. would do a joke about the about the idiot Ohio legislators who want a a a, a a junior high softball coach could stop the game and demand that an opposing girl on another team have her genitals inspected to make sure she's not trans. <laughs> I mean, it's like elected officials in Ohio exactly. want to do that. So that's where I would focus my joke, right? It's still on yeah. the world, but it's a, we all choose on who we yeah who's the who's the butt of this joke and who's the hero of the joke. Exactly. You know? Interesting. Okay. Um, wow. So you've been doing this for fucking 40 years, right? Like, well, more or less. Okay. Yeah, I started doing stand-up when I was, say, yeah, 25. So, yeah, a little under 40 years. Damn. Um, and not, you know, and I, you know. Were you at any point ever like a headliner? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I am now yeah, to yeah, the yeah. degree that I... Like, want to go do stand up? Okay, okay. Um, you know, last night I, you were I mean, that, yeah, 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 I mean that. Yeah, so when I go out, honestly, being a feature act is a lot more fun. You do your thirty minutes, and then you you walk off stage. You don't even need to close the show. Whether people had a good time tonight is not your deal. <laughs> That's the headliner job. You Interesting. Know? Okay. Yeah. Um, but I do. You know. We were talking a little bit before we went on about, you know, like finding your voice and, and, and it never only so after you know 40 years, only in the last couple of months have I have I finally gotten to a, a thing that I've been trying to get to my whole career, which is being me on stage. You know, we're all a version of ourselves, but, you know. It's interesting when people who know me personally and have known me for years and been to parties with me and, I'm, you know, we're funny, blah, blah, blah. Then they see me do stand up and they're like, oh, wow, you're really good. But that's not what I expected. You do jokes. And they're like, yeah, I do jokes. And I do do jokes. I like doing jokes. I'm a good joke writer. But for me, I, it, I, I want those to blend. I want to be able to, yeah. you know, and only, and for me, it took two things. One is admitting to the audience that I have no short-term memory and I'm going to need notes. <laughs> I was always, I spent my whole career trying to figure out how to hide my notes and pretend like I'm not looking at them. Especially when I'm doing oh, 40 wow. minutes. I can't really? remember my That's set. That's true. I it cannot right. remember. Now, I can, this, I can talk all day long, but if I'm trying to remember each tag to each joke, I need, I don't need the whole joke written, but I just need... Oh, God, right. After the college, I do the dog. That's wow. all. You know, like any of them. But for me, just acknowledging to the audience, and this was one of the first lessons I learned doing stand-up comedy, actually an improv, an improv class, where a teacher said, the idea of being present, you know, which, but be in the same room as the audience. If it's hot in the room, it's okay to say it's hot. If it's if there's a fire in the room, you can help people out of the room. <laughs> you know, don't be one of these people who is ignoring what you know, and something like that. Just acknowledging what is happening, and I yeah, you know, I make a joke about it. I say you know I have no short term memory, and it's the unfortunately it's the only thing medical marijuana doesn't help. Um, so you get a little <laughs> laugh, and I'm able now I'm able to look at my notes right. Uh, um, but okay, I, I just yeah. had to free, and then it's all my own psyche. Once I give myself permission to look at the notes, I find half the time I don't even need them, yeah. you know? It's like, oh, no, they're there. It's all right. It's like, you know, the, the clonopin in my pocket. I, I know it's there <laughs> if I need it. I don't need to take it every day, you know? So, okay. Yeah. So you being present, that's interesting because recently I was watching an interview with a comedian, Ian Bag. Oh, um, funny. 
uh, they're talking about Such crowd work. Guy. Yeah. And he was talking about how like a lot of times like people think crowd work is just like asking somebody a question and then is like how long you've been married? Two years. Oh well, I've been married three years. Let me tell you about this. And right. he's like, that's not crowd work. He's no. like, that's just you jumping into a joke. You know right. what I mean? And he was saying that like the difference between crowd work is like crowd work is a conversation. So yes. it's like being present, like yes. literally hearing what they're saying and caring what, and that's hard. Yeah. for me. It's hard for me in a regular conversation, <laughs> let alone on stage when I am literally the center of attention. Exactly. Yeah. You have to, cause like you are the center of attention and now you have to give them, but also looking for what you're mining for. Like when you're, in, yeah, when exactly. you're, you know, in, in improv, you you ask for a suggestion, right? And in, in, in the, you know, in, in, elementary improv you ask her suggestions they yell dildo and you do your scene on dildo right or yeah. whatever because and then when you get to be a better improviser you know what you're looking for and you're not not, not that you, you want a specific thing but you know you know you don't need dildo let's okay what else, what else? oh oh psychotherapy that's a new whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. you know if that's a more interesting thing whatever um that's what crowd work is to me it's it's listening intently but also mining it like i like you would on a first date like i'm listening but i'm also looking for the thing that's going to get me laid where's the thing that i can say oh, i do that too you know what it right oh, okay. you know it's it's you know so as a comedian you're you're listening but you're also you know you're looking for so so for instance i don't when i do crowd work i rarely ask like if people are married or i'll i like to ask them things like uh do you have a favorite charity um, I'll say some, sometimes I'll go like, I decide I'm going to give, I'm going to give 50 bucks of what I'm making tonight to a local charity. Who should I give it to? Everyone wants to volunteer that information. Everybody has a favorite charity and it tells us a really interesting stuff about them. Usually yeah. sometimes it, usually it's like, you know, my church or my school, uh, whatever, but you know, you'll get something, you know, the, the melanoma society. Oh, wow. The melanoma. Oh, okay. Now we have a conversation, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's one thing where, where people are like, you know, I hear comics do crowd work, but they always ask those hacky questions. You know, who's partying tonight? <laughs> really? That's what you're going to what do you, what, what's that question? You know, what do you do for work? Right. What? And that, I mean, you can get, you yeah, know, you can I'll, get sometimes. I'll but try to see if there's something on someone. Like if someone's wearing, if someone's wearing like a Hawaiian shirt, like Yale just got some people last time. There's three guys wearing Hawaiian right. shirts, and he called them all three out. He's like, "What the fuck is going on here?" He's right. like, "I know there's like upside down pineapple. What does this mean?" He's yeah, like, well, he, he didn't he get done a proud. I thought proud boys immediately. I think uh, more than one person in a Hawaiian shirt nowadays. They used to be so harmless. Now they're like, <laughs> um, "Oh my god!" But, uh, but no, yeah, you, you you know, part of it is, um, and it's, I mean, Ian is very good at, at crowd work. Um, Paula Poundstone is just and Paula will do an entire show on one conversation sometimes, Damn. you know, and, and it is hilarious. You are not feeling, you know, sometimes you're crowd work and you're like, come on, man, I paid to see your act. <laughs> I don't care that they just got married, <laughs> you know, but she is. Yeah. So do you do a lot of improv? Yes, I did uh, coming up and I love doing it. And so when I go home to LA or San Francisco, I'll sit in with groups or whatever. But I love doing improv. Okay. And it's the best writing exercise. I find it really uh, gets you looking at options. Cause yeah, that's what, do you do improv? I've, I've, so we do like a basic, imp, like with a group that I'm doing <coughs> stand up with, they do some uh, basic improv games. So they do like uh, 99. If you've heard of that, like it's, uh, what is that? I like, probably know it's just not yeah, by that name. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like things walk into a bar. Bartender says, we don't serve you. Get out. And then object says something witty back to the bartender or something. Okay. And then we also have done uh, World's Worst. So you get a profession and then you have to pretend to be the world's worst oh, okay. person at that job. That one, I, it's hard. I don't like that one. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I like my. <clears throat> have you heard of that one? uh uh-uh. These are more like wordplay games, but uh, this That's one. That's another thing I'm noticing. Columbus Comics really like the puns. Yeah. <laughs> I had to talk to Hannah. <laughs> <last night. laughs> 
<laughs> Chloe, you are really because she is. She is she's, naturally funny, and dude. there's no doubt when she walks on stage, people want to laugh. She just has a great personality, and she has really funny jokes. Jokes, but then she does her the the when they're cute. <laughs> but it's like, damn, you know. Shout out, Hannah. We love you. Oh, no, I do. We dude, had this conversation dude, just last night. It's just so funny because she'll sit there and she'll be like, "What? Why did he, was the cloud sad?" And I'm just like, "What's happening right now?" <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> like, well, and actually, this is a uh, this is a conversation I have with Basso a lot, Eric Basso, because it's like. Uh, I saw him kind of like going out of his one liners a little bit and he was like doing some like um I don't know what what the word would yeah. be uh fucking commentary type comedy uh-huh. and I was like dude like this like you were killing yeah. it but even and I've heard them refer to that as those those are not yes they are one line but they're not one line Stephen Wright does one liners yeah um uh, Mitch Hedberg did one liners and they were fully constructed jokes with, with a minimum amount of words, right? That's yeah. why they're so brilliant. Um, they didn't do... They occasion, there was occasionally a pun in a joke. Yeah, I use wordplay to punch up a punchline. Yeah. I don't build the story towards, the oh, word sometimes play. words have two meanings. I mean, that's, that's the, it's the same joke every time, right? The joke is... You see, words have two meanings, right? Every yeah, right? every pun. It's the, oh, right. You're right. Words do have two meanings. Thank you for reminding me of that. Oh, there's another example of words having two meanings. Oh, good. You know, interesting. Now I'm like thinking, do I have? I'm wondering, huh? Now I'm well, that's there. it. You look at it and you're like, is the pay? And and again, comedy wins. If it's funny, don't fix it, right? I yeah. Mean, if it works, it works. That yeah, but. Very often, like I told, you know, Hannah is like, there were three or four of those jokes of just those kind of, you know, puns that written will will be really good bits, you know. And so it was almost the equivalent of now very often realizing that a word has two meanings is the premise to go write a joke. It's not to go on stage and tell people the premise though. Yeah. You know, they don't get to see the premise. They get the joke, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but I've noticed, and, and again, I think part of it is just, it's peer pressure. You're in Columbus. It makes your buddies laugh. And we all, we're all, I mean, that's the, the, the hardest thing to overcome in, in your hometown is the is pressure. to stop performing for the guys at the bar, uh-huh. you know, especially when that's the whole audience. Exactly. You know, um, and that's but I had somebody I heard one of the first times I showed up at an open mic in Columbus. And um, th- there was three or four comics that were just horrible, like they just weren't getting anything. <laughs> and I was going to do just this new thing I was working on, but I was like, but in, I threw in like an opener to get a big laugh. And then I did my new stuff. Um, because it doesn't do me any good to a bad audience. Yeah, I don't need to, exactly. I can do my stuff at home. You know, I can tell my jokes to my 16 year old daughter. I promise you they weren't going to laugh. You know, I know how to do that. But anyway, I heard somebody at the bar make a comment about, you know, pros shouldn't come in and do their, you know, their tested material or something. And I, I didn't, it wasn't to me, it was to someone else. I overheard it. And I was like, what? (laughs) What? First off, thank you for starting your sentence with the word pro. Yeah. And you might want to look what the pros do. Maybe the pros maybe have, have an idea of how you go from amateur to pro in this business. Dude, yeah. Well, <laughs> and the first thing is you get laughs everywhere you go. It, it, it your, oh, anyway, whatever I need to work on. Yeah. That's important. But. My real job is to get laughs. Yeah, and to make know. yeah, and it's like if everybody's laughing and having a good time, isn't your job being done? And for me, for the new material I want, my my material is going to be following laughter on stage, right? That's how I do my act, right? Yeah. So it does me no good to go on after zero 
Walking on stage, no one knows. I mean, especially me. Yeah. Walking on stage, I'm some old guy. I mean, people think when I go to an open mic that I'm either there to pick up my kid <laughs> or, oh, isn't that cool? He must have He's taken so one of those good. classes at the senior center. <laughs> <laughs> you know? He's one I of the know. improv guys coming right. in. <laughs> but again, I have used that to my advantage. Yeah. Well, I was actually going to say that because there was a – I mean, I don't know like how professional she is. I just recently mm -hmm. like met her in person, but there was this older woman that came to the shrunken head recently and she just like kind of like the Do you thing that her name was, uh, is she, she local? Uh, no, she's oh, not yeah. from oh, okay. here. She's oh, right. some, I think, uh, I've seen that on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Know, yeah. yeah. yeah so, right, I, right. Like, so, but she went on stage and I was like, cause I didn't know that she was even a comedian. Uh -huh. And then she went on stage and she fucking murdered. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was, <laughs> dude, yeah. I was like, what is going on here? I felt a lot better about it because she laughed at some of my jokes, but like while she was laughing while I was on stage, I was like, oh, this like, you know, woman who came in and sat at the bar thinks I'm funny. That's hilarious. But then she went up and just fucking was killing it. And I was like, I don't even know who you are. Like, who, what is happening right yeah. now? So I, I love that. Like, you guys lo like to do that. You guys keep to yourselves. You guys aren't. My first time I did save her pint, I went in by myself and I almost didn't went up. I was like, oh my, it's like a liquor store. <laughs> <Seriously>? <laughs> All right, whatever. And I really was going because I wanted, I was in this new community That's and funny. I wanted to meet the local comics, you know. But I forgot what it was, but I could just feel like the, all right, the next person, Mike, is Mike Larson here, whatever. And I come up and I could see people like, oh, this guy's fucking old, you know. And I got a lot, whatever my first joke was. And then I was like, no one expected the old guy to be funny, huh? And then that guy, that killed because, you yeah. know, you, anytime you, you can give voice to what's in people's heart, you know, what yeah. they, they, everyone, uh, but it's true. And so you, again, knowing and, and for open or for people going up and open mics, you know, most of my career, I was following people like me. I was following other white guys around the same age as me, you know, as a young comic. And it was very hard to differentiate yourself. So when you can, you should, right? Yeah. But when you can't, especially like in, in open mic world, um, you know, and I've uh, saying this to, to Xavier, um, y you know, you need to prove at an open mic, you need to prove, you need to show proof of life when you go on stage. Okay. Because the, we assume you suck. It's an open mic. All of us suck, right? That, that's what we assume or not suck, but they're not going to be great. You know? So, you know, I, I know so many like people who have five minutes and they have they save their killer joke for last. And it's like, no way. I mean, you got to open with that. Let the audience know you're funny. And oh, my God, every their sphincters will loosen. You know, yeah. like, oh, thank God. OK, <laughs> you know, and it's now. At a professional show, you do whatever you want. That's fine. They, they, the, the opposite is true. You can go on stage and talk for a minute without a laugh. But people are like, here it comes. You know, <laughs> yeah. But Interesting. Uh, and so much of that is just being be in the same room with the audience. You know, you know, know your – when I do a, a joke writing class, I always say the first rule of life is know yourself. The first rule of comedy is know your audience. You know, and I always give the example. You don't tell the same joke to your buddy on the playground as you do your mom. Right. You tell jokes to both of them. They might be similar to they're gonna be a little bit different, you know, exactly. Um, and just be aware, you know, when you go into a, a you know, um, but <laughs> I don't even know what tangent I got off on. there. No, no, that's great. But uh, Mike, um, we're um, about to wrap this great. up soon. But do you have anything coming up? Any shows that you're doing anytime soon? Um, <laughs> I'm doing a show up in. Uh, in July, doing crackpots up in Ooh. Maslon. Have you been there? I've Maslon? not. I've heard of crackpots though. Yeah, that's a nice club. In fact, in fact, one he wants me to do a to host a Columbus night up there, maybe one Sunday. Oh. And he said we'll do like a caravan of comics, and he'll. Dun, uh, dun, dun. And I said, so I said, yeah, but you pay gas for us to come up because it's a bit of a drive, and I'll bring a bunch of because he want he you should know that because they're actually want. 
they want people. They, we want to meet new funny people. Yeah, it's a new oh, club. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I'm doing Crackpots. Uh, this place I did last night, Birch Bark, which is the canoe livery out in Urbana. They do yeah. an, they're doing this outdoor show, which is awesome. The next one of those is July 15th that I'll be at. But I won't. I'll probably do a set. But the headliner nice. is this guy named Clark Taylor from New Orleans, who, uh, oh, hell yeah. who you should, everyone should see. He tells long, pointless stories <laughs> that are just brilliant. Just, you know. Yeah. He'll Dude. tell a story about seeing a sign for a guy who does home taxidermy, and that that <laughs> is as much information as the story will have. But it'll be. Five minutes with Clark, and it's just, <laughs> oh, it, it, it's, it looks like it doesn't, it, like he's never written any of it down. He's just one of those guys who you could just oh listen to all, I the, really all day I long. I really wish was like that, dude. But, uh, yeah. Hell yeah, guys. Uh, you guys can uh, check me out uh, June 30th at the Funny Bone. I'll be there Great. Uh, with the Midwest Comedy Tour, doing improv, doing music. Uh, we'll be there with Austin Robinson, Robertson, fucking Becky Solin, and Kevin Ruper, and Jake Ian Arino, the headliner. So, okay. yeah. And then, uh, yeah, don't forget, you guys can also support us through our Anchors listener system. Uh, and, yeah, thank you so much, man. Yeah, I this was fun. You. Yeah. Dude, this is amazing. Yeah, we'll definitely have you on again. Like, Yeah, anytime. It's one fun. of the most lively guests that we've had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, guys, thanks for listening. And uh, this was Help, I'm High and Can't Get Down. Boom. Cool.